As you're building Node.js applications that interact with your database, you need to keep an eye out for SQL injection attacks. In this video, we'll show you a few different tips to help prevent SQL injection attacks in Node.js using the MySQL2 package. All right, so before we get into the tips and tricks for preventing SQL injection attacks in Node.js, let's talk really quickly about what SQL injection attacks are. A SQL injection attack is when a user is able to inject malicious bits of SQL into your database query. This may alter the original query and give the user access to read sensitive data, delete data, update sensitive data, and so on, things that you obviously don't want to happen. As you can probably imagine, these types of attacks can be very costly for your application and your business in terms of money, customer interactions, and downtime. All right, now that we know a little bit about what SQL injection attacks are, Let's set up a simple project using Node, Express, and the MySQL2 package to give you a couple of specific hands-on examples of how injection attacks can occur. All right, so I've got a starter uh, Express application installed here or set up here. I've got two packages installed, the Express package and the .env package for handling environment variables. The next thing I wanna do to set this up is install the MySQL2 package. Now we won't go through an entire detail of how to build out these APIs. These are just for demo purposes. If you're looking for a video to cover how to build an API using Node, Express, MySQL 2, and PlanetScale, you can check out the video that we have linked above. All right, so I have the MySQL 2 package installed. Now we need to go and configure this package so we can use it. So we'll start by creating our connection. So const connection equals, uh, we'll use uh, top level await here and then call uh, create connection from the MySQL package that we need to install. So we can import MySQL from MySQL2. And then I like to use the promisified version of this so that I can use async await syntax with my asynchronous queries. So we'll take our MySQL, we'll call create connection there. Now we get our IntelliSense. And then inside of here, we're gonna pass in an object with a property of URI. So I'm gonna pick this from my environment variables and call something called database URL. Now you could go through and set this up. This is just for dummy purposes to show you, but you would end up creating a .env file and you would create your database URL. And then, like I said, if you wanna see how to set this up in full, you can go and check out that other video. All right, so let's say we're working on a hypothetical project where we wanna store code repositories and they can be either public or private repositories and each one will only have one tag. So it may be JavaScript, it may be HTML, it may be CSS. Now in the real world, these would probably have multiple tags, but for demo purposes here, we'll just say each one only has one tag. So we might create an endpoint that we can work with to let the user query repositories based on the tag that they're searching for. So I'm gonna paste in a snippet here for an example of an endpoint that would let us do that. All right, so here's an example of an endpoint that would let users query repositories based on a tag. So we pass in the user query into this route parameter. We can access this, and then you might be tempted to just throw that directly inside of an ES6 template literal string inside of JavaScript. But this is where the problems start to happen. So to show how these queries can be altered, let's create a test.markdown file. This will give us a little bit of formatting around some SQL as we start to show you these examples. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger and then I am going to copy over the actual SQL statement that we have here. So I'm gonna copy and paste this in a markdown and then I'm gonna wrap that inside of a code block marked as SQL. So it'll be three uh, backticks and then SQL and then on the new line, we'll have our three backticks. So here's what our SQL statement looks like when we have uh, kind of thinking about our variable that comes in. So let's talk about the couple of examples. Let's say the user uh, sends a request to repository slash JavaScript. This is probably something that we expect. So this query after sh variable substitution becomes something that makes a lot of sense. So we're querying by the tag JavaScript and then we're also making sure that the public flag is set to one to make sure only public repositories are able to be queried. So this works fine for that example, but what if we were to come in and do something slightly different? What if the user were to input something like JavaScript, and then they added on a closing single quote, then a semicolon, and then a comma. Now things are starting to look a little bit interesting, and let's see what happens when we substitute this in for JavaScript. So the dash dash in SQL is used to comment out a block of SQL. So in this case, what's happening is the user injected a bit of SQL that closed off the query, ended it with a semicolon, and then commented out the rest of what the query was supposed to include 
which means now the user will have access to not only all public repositories, but also private repositories. As you can imagine, this is probably pretty damaging to your reputation and your application if private repositories are now accessible to the public. All right, let's take a look at another example. So let's paste another one down here. We'll paste both of these blocks again. And let's say in addition to adding the query for JavaScript, they do something similar where they close the single quote and then add a semicolon, but instead of stopping there, they add in another line of SQL. So drop table repository, and then the same trick where they add in the comment to comment out the rest of the query. So now let's see what happens when we add this inside of our placeholder. So let's go ahead and paste this in. You can see we have a valid query, which still ignores the public flag, which means the user has access to read all the private repositories. But then this malicious SQL has injected another statement that will actually drop the entire repository table. Obviously, this is going to be very bad for your application, for your reputation, and for your business. All right, now that we have a couple of examples of how things can go wrong, let's talk about how we can fix them. Now, the first thing that actually comes by default with the MySQL package or the MySQL 2 package is the ability to prevent multiple statements from being run. So the last example that we just showed, not only did we bypass the requirement for public to be true, we also then added this second statement, which was drop table repository. So the MySQL 2 package comes with a configuration property that you can use called multiple statements. Now, by default, this is turned to false, which means it won't allow multiple statements to happen. So in the example that we just looked at, the first statement will run and it would ignore the second one. Now, you do have the ability to customize this and set it to true if you want to, but this is typically not something that we would recommend because now you're enabling the potential for multiple statements to be run without you knowing it. So only consider turning this on if you're absolutely sure that it's something you need. Otherwise, you can explicitly set it to false or completely get rid of it because it's set to false by default. The next thing you'll want to do is to use placeholders instead of ES6 template literals or variable interpolation inside of your string. So what this looks like is we will uh, pass in a question mark as a placeholder here. That says this is gonna be our query with some amount of data that we don't have yet. And then when we go to run our query, we're gonna pass in that data inside of an array of the properties to fill the placeholder. So if we had two placeholders, we would have two properties here. Since we only have one, we're just passing in one property. The benefit of this, if we go back to our example, is now instead of treating that user query as regular SQL, it's going to treat it just as a regular string input for that placeholder. So what happened before, if we copy this example where the user input JavaScript single quote colon dash dash, now what this is going to translate to is we're gonna put all of that inside of backticks, which means this is now going to be a string query that we're trying to match the tag on and the rest of the query is still valid where the public equals one. So in this case, it's not gonna return anything assuming that we don't have a tag that matches this exact format, which I can't imagine that you would. So the lesson here is to never add user input directly into your query strings. Make sure to use placeholders for the user input instead. All right, so the next thing we can do is do input validation on the user input before we even try to pass it into a query that we send to our database. So an example of this is let's say that our tags will only have uppercase and lowercase letters. We don't allow tags to be created with numbers or special characters, just uppercase letters and capital letters. So what we can do is we can now put a check on the user input to say, if it doesn't match that format, we'll go ahead and return and say, this is an invalid request that you sent us. So I'm gonna paste in a snippet here for how we can do that. So first, we'll create a pattern, a regex pattern, which is matching just capital A through Z and lowercase a through Z. Then we test the user query, the input that's coming from the user against that pattern. So if that query does not match the pattern, then we return early. Then we will return early by sending a status of 400 and an error with whatever message is appropriate for your users. In this case, I'm saying no special characters and no numbers, please. Another example of input validation that you might do is around input that is meant to be a number. So let's paste in an example here. Let's say you want to allow the users to query repositories by ID. So you'd grab that ID parameter and then you can check to convert that to a number. And if the output of that is NAN in JavaScript is not a number, if it is not a number, meaning it didn't convert to a number successfully, go ahead and again, short circuit to return this status of 400 and you can say whatever error message is appropriate for a user. Again, that's up to you.
All right, so that's a couple of different input validations that you can do. Now, one specific type of input validation that you can leverage is called allow listing. And allow listing is the idea that you have a list of allowed values that you will accept from the user. And if their input does not match that list, then you want to return the error to say, this is not a valid input that we can search by. So we may add an additional validation piece to what we've already done, where we check to make sure it only has letters. And then actually these probably don't need to be side by side. So we could get rid of the first one, I think, if we're doing this one. But we know we only have three specific tags that the user can query by, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Now this is just demo purposes where we have them in an array. You would probably go and get these tags from your database and put them in a drop down menu for the user to select by on the website. But in this case, we have a representation of all the different valid inputs. And if that valid tags array does not include the query that the user sent, go ahead and return that error to let them know this is a problem. These are not the right tags and this query is not going to work. So let's recap the few different ways that you can prevent SQL injection attacks in your Node.js applications. One is to not allow multiple statements. This is turned on by default inside of the MySQL2 package, so you don't have to worry about it. If you're using a different package, just make sure that that is set to false. Next is to make sure you never take user input and inject it directly into your query using variable interpolation like ES6 template literal strings in JavaScript. Instead, you can use placeholders, and what that will do is kind of escape that value and make sure that it doesn't alter your SQL. It then just becomes a string, which in our case was a search parameter that wouldn't match anything because that's most likely not a valid tag that we have in our database. Next up is to do validation on the user input. You can check to make sure it only has lowercase and uppercase letters, that it doesn't have numbers, that it doesn't have special characters. You might do kind of the inverse of that where you only want to accept a number because you're querying by an ID or something like that. Whatever sort of validation that you can do to make sure that input looks good before you try to use it in your SQL query, the better off you'll be. And lastly, a specific subset of input validation is to use allowed list or allowed listing. What this means is you have an allowed list of acceptable inputs of all acceptable inputs. If the user's input doesn't match, then you shut it down and don't let that query go through. So those are a few different ways that you can prevent SQL injection attacks in your Node.js applications. If you have any other tips and tricks or questions, make sure to let us know in the comments below. Thanks for checking out the video and we'll catch you in the next one.